All right. Hi, I'm Eric Partee, Executive Director of the Little Miami Conservancy, and it's my pleasure to, to welcome you all to this session on the muscles of the Little Miami, hosted by the Little Miami Conservancy and Midwest Biodiversity Institute and, and funded by an aquatic education grant from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife. And forgive me as I go through my, uh, there we go. Uh, for those of you uh, joining us that uh, may be less than familiar with the Conservancy and, and the Little Miami, uh, the Conservancy was founded in 1967 uh, by a gentleman by the name of Glenn Thompson uh, to, so that we could provide a, a, a leading role in the protection and, and restoration uh, of the Little Miami National Wild and Scenic River. Uh, the river you may know flows here in southwest Ohio. Uh, flows through five counties, 20 townships, 12 different municipalities, uh, and hundreds of thousands of acres of prime farmland and drains a watershed of well over 1 million acres of urban and rural land use. Over its history, the, the, the Conservancy has been, has had the, really the pleasure of preserving over 120 nature preserves along the Little Miami, averaging about 20 acres in size and partnering with, uh, working with farmers uh, and a variety of people on the river and partnering with uh, many public and, and private organizations, businesses and individuals in a really successful effort to restore this river from uh, a degraded, a severely degraded state when the fish in the Little Miami looked like this. Oh! and quite a, quite a mess and some of them didn't even make it. They were floating down the Little Miami. This was back to, in the late 80s, early 90s. And the river uh, itself just looked like pea green soup uh, from all the nutrient loading. And it was, uh, it was quite, quite a mess. Now contrast that with today. And it, it, is, it is so healthy that even our, our, our favorite fly fisherman, Bill Schroeder can catch some great smallmouth bass. And this is one of his small ones, I think. So, uh, the, this great progress, I think, it's worth mentioning, was was made in large part uh, because it was the efforts were based on good science and, and extensive technical studies that were done, um, really every five to ten years by Ohio EPA, and uh, that generated the good uh, verification data and uh, uh, really helped. And here's a here's a a young Bob Miltner from Ohio EPA holding up uh, some catch of the day. But it was done uh, in very large part through using a win-win approach uh, where we balance out economic development with river conservation. Uh, the, the slide you're looking at here is a, is a developer, a young developer, young, young Dave McKee, which is the fourth guy from the left, uh, handing over a deed to all the riverfront lands uh, at Country Club of the North uh, back in the 90s. Uh, and that, uh, that area is shown there on the lower right-hand corner. So uh, the larger, particularly the larger developers really like the approach that, that we're not out there, you know, to shut them down. And we suspect that uh, uh, there's a way to find that win-win approach. So uh, it's worked out very nicely for us. So after all these years, after what, 54 years now, uh, some 56% of these critical riverfront forest lands and prairies are now preserved. Uh, scores of, of, uh, of fish and macroinvertebrate populations um, have returned to exceptional health. And the habitats along the river that provide not only clean drinking water, uh, but wildlife habitat are home to, you know, 255 different bird species and and a, and a wealth of wealth of wildlife, some of which is depicted here. We're particularly pleased that bald eagles uh, uh, are are nesting on the Little Miami. Uh, the uh, and, and and perhaps arguably, but perhaps most importantly, um, the Little Miami serves as really as a wild and scenic uh, escape uh, enjoyed by uh, over a million people every year. And this is for fishing or for, for paddling. And, uh, oh, excuse me for the glitch here.
There we go. And some fly fishermen out there uh, in, in beautiful downtown Loveland. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, this river has been enjoyed by obviously the Native Americans that were here long before us and uh, all the thousands of people that still call the Little Miami home. Uh, unfortunately, and despite all this wonderful conservation progress, progress success, we have uh, challenges ahead, not the least of which is the deterioration of about some 36 uh, recorded mussel species uh, somewhere in the main stem or on the tributaries of the Little Miami. Uh, and, and frankly, we, I think we all find ourselves uh, frustrated at times that we, we don't have all the answers as to what, what the real causes of this loss uh, are. And, uh, you know, Dr. Michael Hogarth from Otterbein has been uh, good enough to be down here on the Little Miami sampling the mussel populations uh, about every 15 years over the last 30 years. So we have uh, a, good, a good sense of the fact that it, you can see from this graph that the kinds of species that he was finding in 91 and in 2006 and seven of those 36, you know, he was finding a very small number of species and a, and a, and a deteriorated number of, of, uh, of individual uh, individuals. So, uh, you know, this, this frustration and, and frankly is, is complicated by the fact that there, we, we hear continuous talk and, and research into a, a possible impact by a virus or maybe more than one virus, um, not only here in the little Miami, but elsewhere uh, across the country. So uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a labor of love and we're always, we're always looking forward. I think we need to stay positive and look forward to uh, the kinds of discussions we have here uh, at, at the webinar and so that we can keep, uh, keep making progress. Um, anything we can do to broaden the database, and we'll talk a little bit about this, this tonight, um, to understand really what's there and uh, in the little Miami, um, all the better. Um, again, we're pleased to, to have uh, Midwest Biodiversity Institute with us uh, on, this, on this journey uh, to learn from their expertise and help us guide us through these discussions. Um, and uh, we're interested in your, the, the participants uh, in tonight's webinar, your, your sage advice. Um, and we'll be talking uh, about some strategies and, and maybe what, what people think our next steps should be uh, regarding Muscle restoration on the Little Miami. So, with that, I, I'm pleased to turn it over to Chris and, and um, Chris Yoder, co founder of the, the Midwest Biodiversity Institute. Chris, it's all yours. Well, I'm going to quickly turn it over to Anthony Sasson. <laughs> and uh, so, I appreciate the invitation once again to present to. Uh, Little Miami Conservancy and uh, Anthony, that's your cue. Anthony, you must be muted. I can't hear anything you're saying. You're still muted. There you go. Nope. Anthony, you're muted. Anthony, can you hear me? You are muted. We can't hear anything you've said. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Finally. All right. Let me get, try to get the... Uh, this going here. 
I can't get to the, uh, this is in the way here. All right, that's better. Can you see that uh, control panel on the bottom of my screen? Okay, I assume you can't. We're getting full screen of your first slide now. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, well, we've got about four parts here and I better uh, start, start so we don't run out of time tonight. Uh, but first we're gonna uh, cover some of the information on mussels and uh, in the Little Miami, Matt will come back in and talk about the fish and their relationship as host to the mussels in the, in the watershed. Uh, he'll talk uh, some about eDNA, especially related to that issue in general. And uh, then I'll come back and talk about mussels and eDNA, get some examples of that. And then um, uh, we'll have a closing summary and discussion that uh, will give people a chance to uh, ask questions, make comments, have some discussion, and hopefully uh, uh, have some idea of what the next steps might be for Little Miami Conservancy. So uh, keep those in mind. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you got the agenda, but in any case, uh, that's quickly what it is. So here's the, here's the first part. And, and uh, again, put your questions in the chat. Uh, and we'll try to get to them. And if we don't get to those questions, we'll put them, we'll, we'll, they'll be saved and uh, we can get to those later and hopefully get back to you if, if there's something you really uh, need to see or need to have answered, I should say. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about muscle, or identifying muscles, how they reproduce, um, what some of the species to focus on might be, uh, so species richness uh, or the, issues that uh, Mike Hogarth in his survey pointed out, uh, some other data sources that you may or may not be aware of that are out there that are available. And then uh, generally I'll talk about muscle declines and causes here in this first part. Oops. Well, we're in pretty good shape here in Ohio in terms of, in terms of the number of muscles. We're in the Ohio River Valley uh, between that and the Tennessee River Valley, those are the, really the hot spots for mussel richness in Ohio. The number of species is, is pretty high. So you can see Ohio, if you can see my uh, cursor here, Ohio is yellow, which means we're between 70 and 80 species. Actually, there's 60 some species left for the state, but that's not bad compared to the hot spots, which is really like Northern Alabama, Tennessee down here. Those are the really the, the highest numbers of species in the country. Here's a list for Ohio, about 60 species are left. Uh, we have lost some, some are extinct or are no longer found in the state. Those that are in red here are federally endangered or threatened. Those that are in dark uh, or bold here are state listed as endangered, threatened or some uh, special concern. So. About 60, we really are, uh, we really have left in the state. This is the book uh, to use for mussels in Ohio. It really, if you wanna get into identification or learn a little bit about each species. So uh, it was done by Tom Waters, uh, Mike Hogarth, who did your survey in the Little Miami three times, and then David Stansbury at OSU. So it's a, a pretty big book. One drawback is it costs about $90. So uh, you can get a free excerpt of it down here in the lower right. Uh, uh, just, I think the first chapter or so. So that's that's the book for the state of Ohio. It's, it's one of the best books in the country. Alabama has a great book too, as you could expect from the fact that they have a lot of mussels down there. So mussels are some of the most endangered animals in North America. About 300 species are known. Uh, about 70% are considered endangered or threatened or some special status. So the majority of them are having trouble. About 7% are endangered, possibly extinct. 
and only about a little less than a quarter of the mussel species in the country or in North America are stable. So that doesn't leave much room for much breathing room, I guess, for, as far as mussels go. Uh, basically, anything to conserve and extend the lives of mussels is a good thing, but uh, most of them are in trouble. It's not just in the Little Miami, it's not just in Ohio, but even in the areas where they're uh, pretty, uh, where they're more extensive than Ohio, they have trouble. Here's a sort of a conceptual diagram that Wendell Haig, who works for the Forest Service down in Kentucky, uh, uses to explain what's happened over the last century or so. In the 20s to the 50s, there were a lot of dams built. Those block the movement of fish, which carry young mussels to different places. And if those mussels got wiped out for some reason above those dams, that, that area is gone for mussels or for that species at least. Then there was a period of maybe slower decline. And now we're in this period of a long drawn out you know, 50, 40, 50 years of things that we don't really know what's happening. It's an, an enigma, what's going on exactly. It's not because of new dams are being built. There are very few new dams, but there's something going on in general. Sometimes it's known, but most of the time, it's just really uncertain what's, what's going on out there related to mussels. So sometimes it's a whole community of mussels on a stream, other times it's just a species or a few species. Here's what the situation is in Ohio. And the, uh, this is from the, the list of species that are endangered for the state of Ohio. Mollusks means mussels and snails. We have about uh, six or excuse me, 36 or so of the, uh, 60 plus mussel species left in the state in some sort of special status. So that means that the majority of mussels in Ohio are endangered, threatened, or species of concern. Here's where, from this book, here's where all the sampling sites for mussels have taken place. At least those that are in the book, there's, I'm sure there's a lot more than this, but at least in this book, this, this is what they had. And so the Little Miami is right down here. It's actually got a decent number of samples taken compared to some parts of the state. Like look over here in the Great Miami to the west, very few dots on the map, on this map at least, for mussel sampling. Uh, here's the Scioto River in the middle of the state. It's got a lot of samples probably related to Ohio State sampling. Up here in the Maumee Basin, there's uh, what, for whatever reason, a lot of sampling uh, has taken place. So. Uh, you're not bad in the Little Miami, but um, uh, there's some places that are a lot less sampled than, than where you are. So here's some uh, species that are listed for the state. Uh, I'll just go through this real quickly because you'll get this, uh, these slides later on. But there's a, there have been three federally endangered species. Here's the state listed species, meaning endangered or threatened for the state of Ohio. And then here are what I consider to be the relatively common species for the Little Miami River watershed. And uh, basically looking at Hogarth's uh, report and trying to pull out the ones that for the most part aren't uh, listed by the state, but here's a couple, three of them that are, that are in bold. That means they're state listed species, but all these others are relatively common species for Ohio and more likely to be found in the Little Miami. So those are the ones that are uh, more likely to be found. So mussel ID. Here's what you would see if you went out and looked and actually saw a mussel in the substrate, in the, in the gravel. Not much, it's really hard to find. You're just gonna see these slits about an inch or so across. Very difficult to see, especially if you're passing over in a canoe or something. You're not gonna see something like this, which is a, one of those pink uh, heel splitters opened up and you can see why it's called the pink heel splitter, but that's, you're not gonna see something catchy like this. It's gonna be a lot more subtle. Also, if you're out there, if you pick one up, technically you might be violating the, a, a state requirement or a state law, but um, people do that all the time, I'm sure. 
but you need a scientific collection permit to handle or remove mussels from the site. And uh, also certain times, and MBI has had to do this, sign a non-disclosure agreement. We had to sign one with uh, ODOT, for example, on where the mussel locations were and some data that we got from ODOT. Here's, here are the free identification guides. So again, you'll get this in the file that uh, is gonna be sent out later, but uh, there's some free guides. Here's the ODNRs. Uh, the Muscle Guide, for some reason, isn't on ODNR's website right now, but it will be. Here's one for Muscles of the Midwest, was done by some, uh, some folks in Illinois. Here's one from the Maumee Drainage and the Chicago, which means Northern Illinois. Both of these have a lot of the species that are in, the, in Ohio and in, in the Little Miami. So uh, it's not really that much different. And then you can also go to iNaturalist and find uh, species there to compare to if you see something out there. So there's some resources, some free. Uh, muscle ID, here's a muscle, there's a, a few, uh, example. There's a few things. The umbo right here is the beak. It's where the muscle first starts to grow and expands out these annual growth lines, by the way. But there are bumps on them. Here, this one's got the, what they call a dorsal slope. There's a ligament, which is a hinge that joins it together. You're not gonna be able to learn much about muscle identification here tonight, but I'll just show you a few. Here's some examples of what they look like in terms of shapes. Uh, here, this is sort of triangular. Triangular. This is a club shell. You used to have this in the Little Miami. I don't think it's there now. Here's the rabbit's foot. It comes in some different colors too. It's more elongate. And uh, they might be sort of oblong, I guess you'd call this, or maybe somewhat circular too. So uh, here's the pistol grip. You have that in the Little Miami, especially in the lower part. Uh, but, you know, they come in different shapes. That's one way to tell them apart. Here's some other examples of shapes, almost round here in this in this one, this floater. Here's a rainbow, sort of oblong. This one's semi-circular. Then this pink heel splitter again, same species I showed you before, but it's pretty flat. And uh, if, if it was closed, uh, you could see why it has the, why it's called the heel splitter. It has a sharp ridge here, sort of a wing that sticks up and it's real narrow and uh, almost, almost knife-like if you stepped on it. So here's another way, <laughs> another problem, I guess. Some of them look really a lot alike. So these are three species, all of which have been found in the little Miami, but here's a federally endangered species, maybe gone now, but it's snuff box, but see how much it looks like the elk toe over here on the left and a little bit like the creeper over here on the right. So these other two aren't nearly as rare as a snuff box in the middle. So some other ideas about identify, identifying mussels. You've got some tubercles or some big bumps on some of the species. There's another one that has bumps, but it's also got this what's called a sulcus, this, this, uh, this groove in the middle of this shell that goes between sort of two ridges here. So that's one way that some species are identified. Another way is looking at this beak this umbo, this, the part where they join together here, here right next to the ligament, this pointy part here has some features that muscle experts look at to identify species. So uh, that's, that's some examples of, of uh, ways to identify. Here's some more species in the Little Miami slipper shell found in the headwaters, pretty small, quarter size, maybe nickel size even, can be really small. Here's the fat mucket. You see these green rays coming off or coming from the from the beak here, from the umbo. Uh, that's a way to identify it sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't have those rays. Uh, this is a pink paper shell or pink heel splitter. So it, it has a, this distinctive wing here. You've got those for sure. This is the white heel splitter. It looks a lot like the pink, but it has these ridges here on the wing. So that's a quick difference. Here's that pistol grip down in the lower little Miami. Look at these bumps all over it. And it does, does look like a pistol grip if you, if you squint a lot. So 
uh, sometimes they have some resemblance to what their name is. We'll just say that. There's one called a three horn. There's a three horns, warty back. It's a state listed species that's found in Little Miami. And here's some, probably the most common thing you'll see is the Asian clam uh, all over the place, or it has been. Hogarth even pointed out that this was affected uh, in his last survey. It's an alien species, so not, not native to Ohio, but really common these days. Here's a rare species, federally endangered, the snuff box. I showed you that before. Here's two that look a lot alike, the fawn's foot and the deer toe, two different species, but pretty similar. All right, the reproductive cycle. I know Matt's gonna talk a little bit about this for us, so I'm gonna, or later I'm gonna skip over this, this slide here. Uh, but I wanted to show you, this is what a muscle, there's a muscle right here. And here's the lure that it use, uses to attract a fish. And it's gonna, the fish is gonna come in and strike this part right here where the, the, this is a female muscle that's holding a bunch of its young larvae in, in this area right here. And when that fish comes, it's gonna shoot out these, these glochidia, is what they're called, young larvae, young mussels, and basically infect the fish with it. It doesn't really hurt the fish. The fish travel around for uh, days or weeks with these on it, but that's what they use. Here's one that's actually trapped the fish inside this darter uh, made the mistake of investigating this partly open uh, mussel shell, got its head caught in it when the mussel sensed that the fish was getting close, clamped down on it, and now it's shooting the sclachidia into the mussels, into the darter's uh, uh, gills and head. It'll be stuck on the fish Sort of like this. These are little tiny, tiny mussels that are now attached to a fish. This is the same type of fish. So this has blown up quite a bit. So, okay, species to focus on. In other words, what, what, uh, what's important or what's most likely to be a, a target mussel for looking at uh, how mussels are doing in the Little Miami? Here's the rare species that are endangered, threatened, they're a special concern. I've marked all these. Again, you can see this later in the, um, in the file that's sent out. But uh, there's, there's a number of rare species. Uh, here's uh, some examples of, uh, this, is, this one is relatively rare, it's state listed. These two aren't state listed, but they're, they've been in the watershed. And this is slipper shell over here again, maybe lost from the headwaters. We're not sure what's going on there. So here's a bunch of species that I've listed that uh, might be, here's, here's some points about them. You know, it's declining or maybe it's extirpated, meaning you can't find it anymore right now in the, in the watershed. So some points about certain mussel species that uh, to look at. So uh, important points, these aren't, all the most, these are not the most rare species, but uh, something to look at later. Uh, summary of the Hogarth report. I'll go through this quickly because uh, some of you probably saw that uh, uh, in the uh, video that uh, I think Little Miami Conservancy posted. So what he's saying is most of the mussel species have declined over the past 30 years in his surveys. Here's some that are expanding maybe, but they're doing so at the expense of the other species who, which have declined. And the headwaters, so Little Miami main stem, these tributaries, looks like a downward trend. The midward midsection, he called depauperate. In other words, really down. Um, East Fork losses have slowed which is a good thing. Uh, this is one that's sediment tolerant, still there though. Uh, some species are replaced other species. And here's that link, uh, which you can get from uh, Little Miami Conservancy. 
Sorry to go so fast, but I wanna make sure I finish giving that his time. Here's a list of species that have declined that he lists in his report. Asian clam also declined. So that's important. Uh, good, good clue, but uh, we don't know why. And uh, seems to, what he says, point to some sort of pollution event. Maybe it was a low dissolved oxygen, maybe it was a toxin, don't know. And then he points out few river snails, which are an indicator he looks for before looking for mussels. So important point there also. Um, other data sources, ODOT, uh, OSU, Ohio EPA, I'll run through these quickly here. Here are the, here are the contact people for those. Uh, ODOT has projects where they do reports. Every year they have dozens of these. OSU has one of the country's largest databases for a state, going back 100 plus years. Ohio EPA does list some uh, mussels in their reports. They don't do a whole lot in that area, but they list all the fish. And the fish data from Ohio EPA is among the most extensive in, in the country. In fact, uh, we might be among the top states. We are among the top states in terms of collecting fish data. So there's a lot there and it can be used relative to mussels too. Here's all the reports, or not all the reports, but some reports from Ohio EPA in the past 20 years or so, 15 years at least. Uh, and then finally, muscle declines in general. Um, Wendell Haig, he's, he's sort of a national guru. He's, he's down in Kentucky. He wrote this book, which is something like, I don't know, several hundred pages long, 500 pages long. And uh, he goes through the, the you know, general things related to decline of muscles dams, uh, harvesting mussels, which they did down in the Ohio River. They just formed piles of mussel shells. They would go into the river, pick them out live, let them die, shuck out the live part of the mussel, and then sell the shell. And the shell went, was turned into buttons, uh, for example, back until the 1940s or so. Sediment, other pollution, whatever that might be, sewage, host fish loss, invasives, diseases, and then an enigma <laughs> for other things, okay? And here's a, here's a sort of a summary of something he's written to a document, Biodiversity on the Brink. He's talking about the muscle problem in the country, for the, whole, the whole continent, actually. Here's some recent articles that have been written uh, related to that problem. Uh, I want to give you, I just run over this uh, quickly. He's also pointing out, he thought that corbicula, this Asian clam might be part of the problem. But on the other hand, mussels and a corbicula often occur together. And like we saw in part, at least part of the Little Miami watershed, they went downhill to, together also. So whatever affected the uh, regular mussels affected these too. I know I'm running out of time. I need to get down to the end here for my part before Matt takes over. Uh, I'm gonna skip through most of this, but uh, Haig says, uh, you know, rethink what you're doing. And especially here down at the bottom, don't walk away from degraded streams. Uh, in the Sayeta River, we saw almost, there was almost no mussels uh, in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, a lot of them have come back after the cleanup was done on the City of Columbus wastewater plant. So here's uh, Waters, Hogarth, and Stansbury's book from 2009. Similar problems pointed out for the state of Ohio. This is what they were, they were uh, emphasizing. All these things nas known nationally as potential problems also. And then Hogarth's report pointed out uh, so, uh, several things about declines, some positives too I wanted to point out. Uh, certain species, for example, the three ridge. There are juvenile mussels in some of the, in part of the watershed. So that's good. It means there's reproduction. He thought there was a lot of silt in Todd's fork. Uh, and then maybe competition from these invasives at Caesar Creek. And it's pointing out the low DL levels maybe also. 
and uh, getting close to the end of mine here. Uh, good thing East Fork has re retained a portion for greater proportion of its muscles, but the great degradation is evident. And uh, he wants to point out that that's, that's one that's really on the brink here. A couple of species that are federally endangered are uh, probably gone from the watershed. That's what extirpated means. The positive though, is that the freshwater drum is spreading certain species. So that's good to see. Uh, he also saw a lot of old shells is what he's saying here. He saw snails missing again. Uh, so those are important red flags. You see a lot of very old mussel shells that uh, compared to new mussel shells, that's not good because you really wanna see dead new shells. Uh, that's an indicator that the mussel died recently. If, if you don't see fresh dead, mussels dying recently, that means it's been a long time. But there's also good restoration, restoration potential, even though there's degradation, because there's still quite a few species present. So uh, don't forget that. So that's what I have. And I should, whoops, stop sharing. Uh, what am I doing wrong here? Somebody help me. <laughs> How do I get off the screen sharing here, Matt? There's a stop share button there, a red yeah, stop it should share be, button but there somewhere. On why do I not see it? There it is. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Matt, can you bring yours up? Uh, yep. Let's see here. Okay. So in my portion, we're going to be talking about uh, fish of the Little Miami, its tributaries, and eDNA, and what kind of work it uh, has been done with fish. Um, I'm not going to go too much into all the fish of the Little Miami um, or its tributaries as far as identification is concerned, and all the uh, more than 80 species, 90 species that have been collected over the years. Um, I we did that before. Um, here is the link for both session one and two. Um, if you guys want to take a gander, it's all on YouTube at the fish and how to ID them. Um, but in the Little Miami watershed from the different surveys, um, you know, you have a, around 80 species for each survey from 93 to 2017 was the last one that we actually did. Um, the use designation for the Little Miami is exceptional for a very long stretch from River Mile 3, so that's just downstream of Beachmont Avenue, all the way up to River Mile 91.64. Uh, that's a long stretch to be exceptional. Um, also, the East Fork Little Miami is exceptional for a long way. Um, except basically its whole stretch except for River Mile 22.6, which is warm water. So the fish assemblage quality, um, these are IBI scores from 98, 2007, 2012, and 2017. Um, the 2012 and 2017 are MBI and 2007 and 98 are Ohio EPA. You can see that the fish assemblage is good to ex excellent. Um, there are really a lot of species, a lot of sensitive species. You have gravel chub, variegate darter, river red horse, all readily um, throughout the main stem, especially in the lower portion. Uh, mountain mad tom as well, uh, and short nose gar and blue sucker, which are state listed species, in addition to the mountain mad tom, have also been collected in the lower end. From our survey in 2017, you can see um, IBI scores by river mile. Basically it meets where it needs to. So it's exceptional from river mile three all the way up to our uppermost site around 27.9. Um, 
the fish looked really good. And the warm water downstream of Beachmont was essentially the backwater for the Ohio River. Uh, so there wasn't quite the habitat available as upstream. Uh, another uh, portion, so we'll talk about some of the major tributaries. Um, not a lot of recent data on some of them. Um, O'Bannon Creek and Todd Fork, especially, you know, 2007 was the last time they were really sampled. Um, Sycamore Creek, we did um, two sites downstream, uh, at, downstream of River Mile 1, so we were near the mouth. And both of those scored pretty well, but the bulk of the uh, information is from Ohio EPA in 2007. And it, it ranges from, you know, fair all the way up to excellent. Um, Duck Creek is still not a very nice place. Uh, it's, it ranges from very poor all the way up to um, fair. But one of the good things in O'Bannon Creek um, is that most, for the most part lately, it's been exceptional. Um, it has the endangered um, big-eyed shiner in it. Um, here we have the most recent surveys, uh, 2012 um, by MVI. Um, we have exceptional uh, and very good scores. Um, we have excellent scores from Ohio EPA in 2007 and the lower end. Uh, which is quite a bit better than what was observed in 2012, where it ranged from fair to good. Um, the headwaters appear to be a bit of an issue. But for the most part, the lower end towards Little Miami um, is exceptional. So how do we catch our fish? Well, for us professionals, we use a little bit of electricity um, and anglers will use, you know, hook and line to catch your sports fish. And then you also have a new micro fishers, uh, a new, new little sect of fishermen. Um, and also you are allowed to seine in Ohio, but uh, not between 9 p.m. and 4 a.m. Uh, no taking of uh, threatened endangered species. Your mesh has to be smaller than a half inch. Uh, your seine can't be very large, four feet by eight feet. Uh, and you are not allowed to seine in ponds, lakes, or areas owned by the Division of Wildlife. Um, and also, if you are gonna be seining, you do need a fishing license. You can't just go out there because you have a net. Um, that is the same for microfishing. If you got a line in a pole, you got to have your permit. Uh, microfishing is interesting, as you can see here. Uh, one of my coworkers, Paul, he went out um, fishing and caught a red side dace. And that's not something normally you'd, you'd target or catch on hook and line. So there are a lot of people going out and they're even catching darters um, and small catfish called mad toms using this technique. For us, uh, we use electrofishing. Um, you have to have a scientific collector's permit to use this method. We use pulsed DC current. Uh, the direct current does not kill the fish. It stuns them. We scoop them up. We put them in a live well, um, something like that. And that, that is aerated and that keeps the fish until we count and weigh them uh, after IDing down the species. There are, there are companies or entities that use AC current, which is the same as in your house, which that will kill the fish. Um, we don't do that. The, as you can see, the size of the water body determines the gear, um, the backpack, electrofish are generally small streams, tote barge, moderate sized streams, and so long as we don't submerge the truck, the boat is in uh, large rivers. So here we have um, from Ohio EPA, what 
we would use to dictate the gear um, used to sample. Again, very small water bodies. We can use a backpack or a long line, which is a, a different type of bank set gear, basically um, an extension cord with a, with a net on it. Um, weightable streams, it, where we use the tote barge. Small and large rivers, we'll use boats. We can use them of varying size, 12 feet to 16 foot, depending on um, the size of the river, the drainage area and width. And then for the Ohio River and Lake Erie, we have bigger boats with larger generators. So freshwater mussel hosts. Um, here's the little rainbow darter, which you will see in a precarious situation shortly. So fish and mussels kind of go hand in hand. Um, the glochidia or the larval form of the mussels will get uh, basically thrust upon the host fish as Anthony showed you earlier. Um, they're the parasitic larval form of the mussels. They attach, they take nutrients from the fish until they are ready to fall off. And because fish move, that's how the mussels move. So here we have a, a lure, an example of one um, from a mussel species. And then that precarious situation, the rainbow darter found itself in um, by sticking its nose probably where it shouldn't have. Um, so the mussel has trapped it. Uh, it will basically um, shoot its glochidia down its mouth into its gills and all over its face, as Anthony already showed you. Um, and this is how uh, muscles move around. Um, the fish will swim away fine. It generally doesn't do damage to the fish. Um, it's just an uncomfortable way for the fish to spend a few minutes of its life. Um, so mussels can have one, a few or many host species as far as fish are concerned. Um, and a fish can be host to multiple um, mussel species. We don't really know. Uh, Hogarth has a list um, of mussels and fish hosts that may not necessarily be uh, complete and really likely isn't. Uh, there are plenty of gaps to be filled. So here, we'll, I'll just go over a couple examples. Um, freshwater drum seems to be a pretty big uh, mover of mussels through watersheds. So the freshwater drum is a host to quite a few species that we know of, could be more, um, and a species of concern, uh, a threatened species, and washboard which is a state endangered species. So these are all state listed. Um, uh, those three are state listed, either threatened or species of concern or endangered. Um, freshwater drum in the Little Miami River. You can see a general uh, decline in the numbers collected uh, from the mouth of the Little Miami all the way upstream. So generally they kind of fall out now around river mile 80. You don't really see them upstream of that. It's probably a lack of suitable habitat in regards um, to their absence. They're generally a big water fish. Uh, and on the right, you can see that the number of species or the number of uh, drum collected per sample on average has increased since 1977 uh, to our final sample here in 2017. Uh, so that's part of the reason why some of the mussels have been expanding. Uh, so here is uh, freshwater drum distribution up through the Little Miami watershed. Um, as of two, uh, 2020, the larger the dots, um, the more individuals that have been collected at that location. So you can see down towards the mouth quite a few in a, quite a few locations. Um, and then once you get up towards the headwaters, you get fewer individuals collected and they're more sparsely collected. 
one of the um, muscles that uses freshwater drum for uh, distribution is the three-horned bordyback. Um, the white dots on this map are freshwater drum uh, collection sites, and then the orange dots are um, Hogarth collections from 1990 to 2020. You can see they match up pretty well. Um, where there's drum, there are collection sites for um, three horn warty back muscles. Uh, the same goes for fawn's foot, um, except for the one site over there in the headwaters of the uh, East Fork Little Miami River, that may be due to a separate um, host as the East Fork Lake Dam blocks um, freshwater drum movement upstream. So they haven't been collected up there. Um, and the, so this, the, the deer tail also uses the freshwater drum as a host and you have the, the same kind of distribution where, where there's freshwater drum, except for in a couple smaller areas, well, except drum have moved up through there. Um, except for the East Fork, their drum aren't up there yet the mussel species is. Um, again, it's probably another host species using or being used for its distribution up there. So the white heel splitter um, is another species that is used, that uses freshwater drum as its host. Um, here we have white heel splitter distribution as pink dots um, from, from 1990 to 1991 for Hogarth survey and white dots are freshwater drum uh, distribution from 68 to 91. Uh, the number of fresh dead um, live mussels and um, long dead are are numbered at each collection site for um, white heel splitters. And then we have this interesting, there's no freshwater drum, yet there are four collection sites for white heel splitters in the East Fork. Um, and here we have Hogarth collections in 2020 and 2021, and then freshwater drum distribution from 1991 to 2020. Again, you have an increase here in the East Fork in both numbers and locations collected. And you also have at certain sites an increase in number of fresh dead um, live mussels and long dead as well. Well, this East Fork is a little interesting because there's no freshwater drum, but there's an expansion in the number of white heel splitters. This is because mussels use multiple host species. So on the left, there's distribution for largemouth bass. And then on the right, you have distribution for green sunfish. Uh, the white heel splitter uses both of these species as hosts uh, in addition to the freshwater drum. So even though the drum isn't there, uh, where there's a will, there's a way, or at least in this case, where there's largemouth bass and green sunfish. Uh, the white heel splitter is also something, uh, a species in which Hogarth said that may be expanding because of increased silt coverage uh, and it's more tolerant to it. Well, the green sunfish is tolerant of a lot of things and a tolerant species uh, by the Ohio EPA. And then the largemouth bass is, it's not considered tolerant by Ohio EPA, but it certainly tolerates a lot. So that is likely why there's an increase in numbers and distribution in the East Fork for the white heel splitter. The channel catfish, um, they also are a host for a number of species, including uh, a few state endangered, um, including the little spectacle case, warty back and washboard. Um, the Channel catfish has been readily caught throughout the uh, Little Miami watershed, um, both in the upstream and the East Fork, as well as um, major tributaries. And again, the larger the dot, the more 
uh, individuals collected at that site. Um, and here, the pistol grip uses the channel catfish um, as one of its hosts. And the pistol grip doesn't have very many host species that we know of. Um, it uses the yellow and brown bullheads as well as flatheads um, for its host species. So we know that the, uh, through the main stem, uh, primarily it's using channel catfish for its distribution. Um, one of the other, one of the other uh, attributes for the pistol grip is that it prefers gravel substrates. Um, it generally stays more towards the surface um, and likes the coarse material. So here we have locations of channel catfish collected in the lower Little Miami and the lower East Fork. Uh, in addition to being, uh, in, in addition to the, the pistol grip uh, collections by Hogarth. Um, and what I've added are uh, qualitative habitat evalu evaluation index um, data collected by MBI in 2012. That includes gravel as one of the two uh, major substrates. Uh, so it's one of the two dominant substrates uh, at the site location. And you can see from a couple of these collections that habitat also plays a role in location. So there's at least three dots that are directly on. And another one is very close to gravel substrates uh, as observed by MBI and collection of channel cats. So that's a, another little uh, addition, something else to think about when talking about muscle distribution. So we're gonna move on to environmental DNA. Um, what is it? How do you collect it in the lab processes that gets you to identification? Uh, so Matt, can I, Matt, can I uh, make just a housekeeping thing here? If you've yep. got, if you can put your mute on, not, not you, Matt, but uh, the other participants, if you could put your mute on, uh, that would be good. Thanks a lot. So eDNA is DNA collected from the environment and not from the individual. It can be collected from the air, water, and soil. It's shed from the organism, not taken directly. Um, so the idea of taking eDNA is to better detect sensitive or rare species that can be con missed by conventional means. So maybe electrofishing or gill nets or bike nets, just normal means of collection, uh, maybe it misses it. Um, the reduced amount of gear used can make it easier to remote uh, to sample in remote areas uh, if that's a concern. Um, so here we have, you know, a remote area where you had to take a backpack, electric fisher in, if you have invasive species that you might want to detect, uh, like this silver carp, uh, or maybe difficult to catch some rare species like lake sturgeon in certain areas. So some of the collection methods. Uh, it can get pricey. Uh, Smith Root likes to make it that way. Uh, the, their eDNA samplers, their backpacks are about six grand. Um, plus you, the, plus there are add-ons like uh, an extender pole that's um, not cheap. They have a little citizen scientist handheld sampler that's still really expensive. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be that way. Uh, you can do a grab sample like uh, this guy here. Uh, you just wear gloves um, and you change your gloves each time you do a new sample so that you're not cross-contaminating. And when you're doing a grab, grab sample, you thoroughly rinse your jar um, and before you take your initial sample so that you're getting anything out of there that might um, degrade the DNA prematurely. It's less costly. Um, you can get 
field filtering equipment for relatively cheap. Uh, it's not too bad. Um, and then the USDA does have a protocol for eDNA, although part of their protocol is um, does use that a citizen scientist type handheld sampler. Um, there is this new kit, which we'll go over here in a little bit uh, by Jonah Ventures called the Jonah Water Kit. Um, for the kit and the running of the samples, um, it's $90. And I did talk to um, the company as well. And if you wanted to add muscles to your sample, um, then it would be another 50 to $55 is what I was told. Um, on top of any of the other sampling methods, you would have to find a lab and you'd have to deal with um, their pricing. So the smooth fruit uh, over here on the bottom left, it filters as you sample. You actually stick a filter in there and the water goes up through and you can control how quickly you um, pull your water uh, and a whole bunch of different things. You can take GPS coordinates. I figure handheld would do just about the same, but it's a little toy. Uh, you can filter in the lab in the field using your Erlenmeyer flasks and your filter funnels. Um, you want to either decontaminate or change your filter funnel each time you uh, do a new sample, you filter a new sample because you're very worried about cross-contamination, it can easily happen. Um, the protocol for how much water you filter or how much you collect per sample, it varies with everybody's protocol. There's nothing really standardized. Um, the Fish and Wildlife does have a QAP um, specifically for silver and big head carp. Uh, you need to preserve your DNA with 95% non-denatured ethanol or uh, isopropyl alcohol within 24 hours after the collection ends and samples must be stored in the dark on ice for that period of time. So the Jonah water kit, uh, it's all in one. It has your filter, your preservative, um, and it has your postage. You, you send it back in. They use a meta barcoding um, which we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, that will sample all species on the filter paper. They did say that if they don't have a species in their database, you can send them um, either the whole fish or uh, a portion of it, as long as there's confirmed ID, um, and they can add it to their database. database. But uh, you cannot preserve it in formaldehyde because that will destroy the DNA. So it has to be preserved in ethanol. Uh, so and this is something that actually um, the LMC has already gone out and tried at least once. So here's what you get in your kit. Um, you get your filter, your sterile syringe, um, your, uh, your preservative, your caps to ensure that nothing goes in to your filter after your sample, and then a protector to ship it in. Uh, nice little instructions that looks much more simple than the IKEA cabinet I put together for uh, my kids. So that's kind of nice. Um, and then obviously your, your envelope for shipping. And it's pretty simple, syringe in the water, you pull up your sample, 50 milliliters or so, and then you put it through the filter. Now, once you send it to the lab, what do they do? Well, they extract the DNA from the cell, they sequence it, amplify it, and then they run um, a computer program, most of them are in R, uh, to identify your um, species. So most of it is PCR, your polymerase chain reaction. Um, it makes numerous copies of DNA so that it's detectable for their equipment. 
Um, they use specific sections that are unique to the organism, um, which then get multiplied until they're detected. Uh, these are some of the genes that they use, the 12S RNA, 16S, 18S. Um, these are the different genes. And they actually have been experimenting different people with um, different regions to determine what is best for using on fish. Um, the lab processing, there's a whole lot of different ways of doing it. Um, there's metabar coding, DDPCR, qPCR, uh, mitochondrial PCR, real-time PCR, NPCR, um, all can be, metabar coding is the one that is used for identifying multiple sample or multiple organisms in a sample. I think uh, one or two of the other ones might have that ability uh, or so claimed. So fish and eDNA, uh, well, the long ears just hanging out in the water secreting DNA. Um, and so it's used for presence and absence uh, detection. Um, you might be able to identify locations of small populations of target fish, um, sample areas where uh, getting equipment is impossible or difficult. Uh, it can, it's being used currently for early warning for invasive species. Um, Silver and big head carp specifically in the Maumee, US Fish and Wildlife are doing that. Um, there are people who claim they can calculate relative abundance. Uh, others and the same claim they can calculate biomass. But one of the things that cannot be done for sure is determine physical condition of an individual fish. Um, you can't determine if a fish has tumors or lesions or eroded fins just from collecting an eDNA sample and having it run. Um, so citizens in eDNA like this current citizen and maybe future scientist. Um, so the sample collection is really simple. All you gotta do is dip a sterile uh, um, jar, fill it up, filter it, maybe not even filter it, maybe you can just ship it to a lab. Um, it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, it's not difficult to do. Um, there's you know, potential in it with identifying changes in species composition when uh, resources are limited, such as money or experts, maybe you identify uh, a possible problem that you go, hey, maybe you should go look at this. Uh, that has already been tried in England uh, for the great crested newt. Uh, they, they had citizen scientists sample 239 known ponds uh, possessing great crested newt. Uh, those scientists, citizen scientists, um, got a positive detection rate of 91.3% and false negatives of 8.7. Um, for me, 8.7 is still a little high, especially when they were already known through other methods. Uh, and well, the LMC, um, did the test and results are pending. Uh, something about mid-June maybe. So limitations for eDNA. Databases, um, if you don't have all the species and then you get a bunch of false negatives and there's nothing you can do about it because you, you don't know. Um, it's just not in the database, so it would never detect it. Uh, and they're not standardized. They, you just, not everybody has the, the same number of species, the same species. Um, so I know Jonah, Jonah Adventures is missing something where we talked about uh, with the white heel splitter, with the green sunfish being a host species, they don't have green sunfish in their database. Um, there's also, you don't know where that DNA came from that you have ID'd. It could be an adult, it could be a juvenile, it could be larval, it could be bird feces, a bird that you know had a snack in, in one creek and flew to the other. Um, and it also could be a, a gamete, it could be an egg uh, that you happen to pick up the DNA from. Uh, there have been studies where 
the laboratory processes. There could have been contamination in the field that caused false positives. They've, they've detected marine species in freshwater systems, which they weren't there. Um, you have false negative issues, again, with the database being limited. Um, you could have environmental substances that degrade DNA, uh, or you could have poor assay design. Um, uh, the primers used in your detection are not the right ones. So and you can also have detection issues where anything from substrate type, flow, water clarity, and water temperature alters how far the DNA will travel in a flowing system. Um, so all things to consider when you're looking at a, 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 a printout for your DNA. Um, Protocols lack standardization. Uh, all, a lot of the papers that I looked at, everybody used something a little different and that can cause big changes in um, your results. And certainly not least, uh, Ohio, uh, state of Ohio agencies, they, they don't accept the data. Um, so a few of the papers that I looked at, um, so Kelly, concluded that uh, diversity studies depend on PCR primers and they're not comparable across methods or studies. Small changes in the lab techniques can produce different results. PCR assays act differently on different species. Uh, Wang uh, stated that the standardization of experimental protocols, data storage and mining and given habitat types uh, implemented, implemented across different localities is urgently needed. Um, and then Rupert, Rupert uh, stated that population structure, size, sex, and age ratios in individual conditions cannot be obtained by using standard eDNA, eDNA metabarcoding alone and are often critical to development of conservation plans. So things like the, the lake sturgeon, um, you, if you get hits on it, you don't know if it's adults, juveniles, um, and that can make a difference on your permitting for, for dams. And so it's a big deal. Uh, so the conclusions for my portion, um, here eDNA shows promise for identifying rare, threatened, and endangered species. Uh, it can be used for uh, early detection as an alarm for invasives um, and with time perhaps quantifying relative numbers and maybe biomass of a, a target species. Um, it, it's really, really difficult to see this coming through um, anytime soon with being able to identify biomass of multiple species in a single sample. <coughs> Excuse me. Current techniques have yet to be standardized in the lab and in the field. So timing, um, so timing of the sample uh, will need standardization as, long, as well as what primers are used uh, and a whole lot of other things. Uh, in addition to false positives, uh, false negatives still plague data sets, limited libraries uh, increases the chance of false negatives. Um, so, a lot of people are saying a lot of really good things about it. Just kind of proceed with caution at this point in time. It's something that's really exciting and has a lot of momentum, uh, but we want to make sure we get it right and just not start going down uh, a wrong road. Uh, but that's my time. I'll toss it back to Anthony. All right, so uh, you can hear me now, I assume. What uh, I'm gonna do is go through quickly. I, I looked at the uh, muscles in eDNA, e and so you're gonna hear uh, some a lot of similar things about uh, eDNA that uh, Matt just talked about, especially focusing on fish. 
and uh, then we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about the uh, eDNA sampling on Dipteries and the main stem, and uh, then we'll go into our discussion after that. So, by the way, if you need to take a break, uh, might be a good time to do it. And uh, but uh, we've got a, over more than a half hour here to go, so uh, keep that in mind, and we'll uh, try to end up by nine o'clock. But again, we haven't built in a break, but uh, you're on your own for that. So. Okay, so if, if you're out there in the stream looking for mussels, where are they going to be? So this is a bottom of stream, a lot of gravel here. It looks like great habitat for mussels because they love gravel. Uh, it's relatively clean, not much sediment, but where are the mussels? How do you find them? Well, if you're in a really big river, this is the Allegheny in Pennsylvania. You might have to use scuba gear. So you're uh, uh, weighted down. You're going down to the bottom. This is five or six feet deep out here. So that's that's the difficult part if you're in that such sort of situation. That's one way they do it. Here's another. They've actually put out some mussels with tags on them. They're electronic tags in this stream. And she is taking a, a reader, an electronic gear, that is detecting mussels as she waves it over. It's just like a metal detector, waving it over the mussels where they know they put them before. This might have been put, the mussels might have been put here years before, but can still be detected because they have these tags glued onto them when they were uh, placed in the stream, just to see if they're surviving, to see if they've moved, uh, to see how many are left. Then, of course, there's the standard visual search where uh, a lot of time is spent kneeling over, looking into the water, looking down at the bottom, sometimes even feeling down into the water, feeling through the gravel with your fingers. You can get that detailed, but finding the mussels that way. And that's that's actually finds a lot of mussels, more than most people are even close to being aware of. Uh, you can, might be able to find uh, in a couple hours search period here. You got three people, maybe you find a few hundred, let's say. So uh, it works. Uh, it's just not what most people are, are familiar with. It's, they're, it's hard to find them. You need to know what you're looking for. And uh, if you're feeling them, how to, how to find them. So here's some considerations for what I found from looking at the muscle eDNA literature. So again, a lot like a lot like the uh, fish literature uh, that Matt was looking at and talking about. Uh, I won't go into some of the same things that he he covered, but uh, so these are the scientific papers. Just trying to really summarize these. So some things you can or can't do. Whoops, uh, with with the muscle eDNA. Uh, you know, there's issues about how likely the detection will be. Maybe you can use it to uh, site or uh, locate other sites where you want to do a visual survey. And the quantification or abundance of the individuals Matt talked about is a problem still in mussels. Uh, it can be easier detection if you have your library of mussels. If it's, if it's complete for has all the mussels you're looking for. And uh, so you, you can, do that if you've made sure you've taken care of this library first. In other words, is all the information there that you need before you even start. Uh, the ability to, to de detect is only as good as that information that's available. So there might be missing species. Also, uh, a lot of literature will talk about uh, interference uh, because of all the stuff that's in the water uh, uh, interfering with the ability to detect uh, mussels. So you might detect more species than they found from visual sampling, or it might be fewer. You might have false positives or negatives, just like Matt talked about uh, species that were there and are missed, or that uh, weren't actually there, but it says there might be, they were. Um, it uh, can be lower cost, should be lower cost, and actually surveying them visually, but it's a supplement and supplement and not really a substitute. 
Uh, again, if you were looking for rare or less numerous mussels, uh, you might miss those same species. So the number can be important. They're finding the same thing for mussels as they would for fish. And maybe you can use it to match the fish host and the mussel species at a site. And again, the same issue if you don't have enough DNA in your sample, especially. So it could supplement, but it's not a complete substitute for the other methods. It could direct you where, as to where to go, or it's a good, uh, it could be a good signal for where to look further. Uh, consideration, some of these are maybe uh, redundant, but uh, the, the amount of time that you, uh, or the, excuse me, not the amount of time, but the time that you're out in the stream looking for the muscle is important. Is it during spawning or that glochidia release where you might pick up some more eDNA? Is the water too high and that may dilute your sample? Uh, maybe you need to increase the amount of water you sample or the number of samples you take, the number of replicates. Uh, it's most dependable for the presence or absence of a species. Uh, at this point, I would not try to estimate population numbers. That's what I'm reading and being told by some of the experts. And uh, you can't do some other things uh, like create a, an index or for the muscle community health. Uh, the distance detecting a species has a pretty wide range. And I'll show you that, an example of that. In other words, how far from a muscle do you have to be to, to detect it? Uh, and de determine your expectations. What are your expe expectations? Do you just want to detect muscles or certain rare species? Or how precise do you want to be? Those types of things uh, maybe need a plan uh, before you start. Uh, how assured is your result? In other words, uh, how comfortable are you with your conclusions and your next actions if you do detect something or not? And then uh, standard methods haven't been established, just like Matt said. And we're, we're behind on muscles compared to fish. So keep that in mind that it, muscles will be slower as far as standardization uh, because they're not as much of a target as, as fish, even though they're more endangered. So it's a, a future tool, a lot, of, a lot of things haven't been established yet. These are technical issues that are important, standardizing things out there that, that determine whether how much we can use this, this eDNA method for muscles. Uh, here's some other studies. Uh, here's four of them I've summarized and the, they'll be in the file. I know this is a lot of stuff here to, to comprehend. So some, some uh, scientific papers, just like uh, Matt was referring to, Here's one by Gasparini, where he looked at one of these species, wavy rayed lamp mussel, that's in the Little Miami. He talked about the dilution issue in the rivers with discharge means flow, diluted by the flow. And then he also talked about a problem where the mussels were at low density. In other words, not many mussels. So he needed more samples is what he was saying. Here's one from uh, Climus and uh, Stepien is up at uh, was up at the University of Toledo. They were looking at some mussels in the Maumee drainage, and looking especially for invasive species, including mussels. Uh, but they they were looking for how to improve their uh, resolution of mussel or mollusk diversity. So they talked about some difficulties in the lab uh, that they found, in, in at least uh, whatever lab they were using. And then uh, they had a concern about being able to try to figure out how many mussels were out there or how, how much biomass there was for mussels out there. Here's the one from uh, Climus at uh, USGS. Uh, she was looking at the Clinch River in Virginia. Uh, they ran their assays for eDNA on these mussels, but they were only around uh, half of the mussel species being detected. So they said, well, we need uh, increased sampling effort to improve our uh, detection. And then also uh, some more research to improve the confidence of what they're referring to in the lab, this meta barcoding, this genetic data that's available in the lab for, for muscles. So they needed to check that out further, they said. Uh, another one where they're looking at uh, 
how, uh, how to improve detection. They found if you're in a riffle, in other words, where there's some uh, disturbance of the surface, uh, water's moving fast enough, you'll get mixing that will maybe uh, allow you to detect mussels better. They found it up to about five miles downstream, they said. Now, maybe, <laughs> maybe there was another mussel or, or many mussels between where they started and where they finished up. But uh, also, uh, they found that the habitat type, the distance between locations and the time of year were in fact, uh, could yield more effective results. And here's an example of a a riffle, you know, with that mixing that they're going to get to uh, better detect eDNA. Okay, so that's what I had for eDNA and mussels. Uh, there's not as much as for fish, uh, but there is some out there and there are people working on it. They're trying to improve it. Uh, USGS and others are, are working on the detection methods and the analysis in the lab and things like that, which will help us make this a, a really good tool. Uh, that's what's needed before it's really widespread in use. So what you're looking at or have looked at is right on the cutting edge of science, we'd say. So here's the last part of our presentation here this evening. Um, and Eric, you, could, you should unmute yourself. I, I just did. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. And then um, we're talk about, uh, you know, what's in the future for Little Miami River watershed related to this, these issues here. And so again, put uh, comments or questions in the chat box. Uh, if, if we don't get to them, we'll be uh, getting to them later. We can do that. And um, here's what, uh, going back to the agenda, here's what was at the top of the agenda here, this program goal. Talked about potential mussel fish host species, confirming their existence, and then eDNA technology related to freshwater mussels in the Little Miami and tributaries. This is the planning effect. So, uh, somebody's got their mute off, so uh, we got some background noise there. Just be aware of that. Thank you. Um, yes. Rick Hoffman. Uh, Anthony, the, um, I appreciate you and, and uh, Matt showing some of the power uh, BI, IBI, well, I've got the terminology right, uh, comparison maps that, that looked at uh, freshwater drum distribution versus muscle distribution um, is it, it strikes me that there, and I'd be interested in, in MBI's response to this, is there additional uh, Power BI type of analysis um, that might be fruitful here to look at locations and, and you know, that would lead us to possible reintroduction sites or, or uh, uh, maybe even manual redistribution of, of freshwater drums. Uh, it, it, it looked like it was once you got above River Mile 60, which puts you up just into Green, Southern Green County, um, that the, the drum population dropped off. Um, I mean, is part of a strategy of reintroduction, um, in, I mean, that, that would be something to, to drill down through and say, does it involve redistribution of, of drum or, or reintroduction of drum on upstream um, at certain times of year when maybe they're clear, carrying glucidia? Um, and they just, there's all kinds of topics here to pursue. I'm just trying to just try to throw out a little bit here and get us started. Matt, Matt and Ed Rankin is also on the uh, call tonight, I believe. So uh, he, they could get to that. They should answer that. Matt and Ed, are you on? Yeah, the those the maps I made with um, the habitat coverage and uh, those I I made with um, GIS. Um, the the data points for the fish were straight out of um, Power BI, which um, is Ohio EPA and MBI data that uh, Ed puts together that nice program. Um, 
I, it's one of those, I, I don't know about redistributing drum. They'll probably do that on their own. Um, uh, you know, the habitat's good enough all the way up, you know, the, the drop off almost to zero is around river mile 80. So that's probably about where um, they'd stop anyway, just because there's nothing much for them up there, not deep pools, long pools, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, using some modeling um, with Power BI and um, maybe GIS or something it, along those lines, you could determine, you know, habitat, uh, of silt coverage, if that's an issue at the site. The QHEI has uh, part of its section is embeddedness with silt. So, I mean, there's definitely ways to pinpoint, you know, good and bad habitat. How, how, how well do you think we have the, like, and you mentioned embeddedness, um, you know, the, the silting over of habitat. Um, does it strike you that, that we need additional data or perhaps there's a, there may be a role for the citizen scientists to be out there documenting um, habitat conditions? Um, yeah, there we actually, MBI does a citizen's QHEI course, so which would cover the in-stream habitat. Um, Ed can go into that in a little more detail since he's the teacher. I think um, you have one coming up pretty soon, as I recall, or maybe it just happened. But uh, yeah, I mean, definitely is something that citizens can go out and identify um, heavy silt areas or, you know, moderate silt or silt free even, if those are, those exist. Hey, uh, and and this, and is, this is, before Ed talks, I wanted to jump in. Um, this is Chris. And this is where you need to <clears throat> kind of be careful with the fish hosts. But we wouldn't normally expect drum in the upper part of the river anyway. They're a, they're a larger stream size fish. So their current distribution is just limited by the size of the Little Miami River. Okay. They're not going to get much farther upstream than they already are. So you're going to have to count on other fish hosts. You know, it, 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 that's where it's going to be important to identify, you know, for a particular mussel species, be sure you know all the fish hosts. And, you know, the distribution of fish hosts could be a limit to the distribution of the mussels anyway. Yeah. But we just, nobody's really looking at this that way. And uh, at least in Ohio. Um, well, I'll, I'll let Ed talk about the, the citizens QHEI is really designed for pretty small streams. I think, you know, it would be better to use the actual QHEI where, where you could actually conduct it. Yeah. And uh, that would be more, more applicable to places like the Mainstone. Okay. And there, and there may be even some other with, uh, I know I talked to Anthony about like uh, places on Darby where there weren't as many muscles and, you know, but perhaps it's due to a uh, combination of factors like some more shear stress on the, on the bottom that doesn't let the, the muscles really colonize very well. So there may be even some additional, uh, we've done like pebble counts before, and there may be ways to identify, uh, there, there are some things where people like buried chains in the stream bottom, and then after a storm, you can go back and see how many links fall downstream to see uh -huh. how unstable the, the substrate. So there may be some other methods that aren't really complex, but you know, might take some uh, labor to go out and do that you, can, you might be able to rate a sort of how stable the substrate might be in different areas. So QHEI can give you some of that, but there may be some other specialized things you can design that might give you some good information. And that's generally an under sort of sampled part of the, uh, uh, the habitat stuff probably isn't done as intensively as maybe it should be in some cases. Because okay. we do Pretty know with, uh, with with climate change and you have increasing, uh, you know, uh, 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 spikes in uh, flows at certain times of the year, especially with development going on. So you have those sort of things uh, uh, happening that, that 
uh, that could cause some sort of stress that make it maybe hard for muscles to colonize very well. It, it, how, how close are we based on what you all have seen over the years, whether when, when you were with Ohio EPA and now with MBI, um, how close are we, you think, from the little Miami of just simply, let's put it that way, simply being able to start a reintroduction process of muscles? Go, you know, go to the propagators, whether they be Ohio or wherever, and start reintroducing um, muscles into the little Miami. Are, 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 could we do that today, given the, do, given the right dollars? or do we need more information before, or do we do that at all? I mean, uh, uh, Anthony, I think uh, might be able, I, I know they've done some reintroductions in other places already. Yeah. Uh, the, sh the short answer is that number one, it needs to be uh, protected in a con some sort of conservation location. Uh, that's, that's one thing that helps to limit uh, certain problems. Then the other is they'll look for uh, pollutant sources, uh, wastewater plants. They have to be far, far enough away that they're not concerned about that. Uh, so the stretches of uh, public, uh, publicly owned riparian habitat are good, as well as uh, further from point sources uh, they like. So uh, this, it's really, if you get into re reintroduction of mussels in Ohio, it's still relatively new, even though it's, they've probably done some with the Columbus Zoo and uh, OSU for uh, around 10 years or more, but uh, you're still, there are very few examples. So look for the point sources, look for a conservation area. Okay. Um, also, somebody asked a question here in the chat box. Is it possible to obtain and analyze a DNA sample in the lab, get the DNA signature, and match that outside the lab to known DNA signatures to identify the animals in the sample? Uh, or does the, does the lab need to do that matching? Uh, they get known uh, signatures, and they're matching them to those. So there's a lot of uh, species already known the lab can take those and match those, or they can do their own. They can figure it out themselves. It's a lot. That's more work, obviously, but uh, there's a lot. There's a, still a lot to do in this area. I've been told. So I uh, hope that answers the question. But it's possible to. Yeah, I've got it. I've got a comment. Go ahead. I just had one one comment on Eric's request. Are we ready? to start reintroducing mussels. And I, I think it, uh, okay, if I could share, have the screen just for a minute, Anthony. Uh, I gotta turn it, here it is. I don't know if everybody can see that, but this is a listing of all the wastewater treatment plants on the Little Miami segment of between the upper Little Miami, lower Little Miami, and the East Fork. Um, this all adds up to about 110 million gallons a day of sewage. Um, and it, compri it can comprise during certain flows about 85% of the flow of the river. Right. So the, the first thing that jumps in front of me is, is ammonia because mussels are extremely sensitive to ammonia. And there was a, a study done that suggests the current ammonia criterion are protective. But even if uh, these plants were all doing a good job, uh, I just think it, it, this is something that has to be evaluated, um, I think, before something like that is embarked on. Hook, and, uh, can, you, can you do that evaluation? We could try, but I mean, it's very involved, and it would it would mean looking at the performance of these all these facilities over time and trying to detect. 
because they may be in compliance with their permit, but we're just finishing up a major assessment of the side of the river in Columbus and Columbus's plants are operating so far below their permit limit. And the river's just doing, you know, it's bonafide exceptional more than the little Miami is. But, you know, so what happens when that starts to creep back up? Are we gonna see backsliding? Um, and Ohio EPA hasn't really rushed to revise their ammonia criterion based on a, a document that US EPA put out back in 2013 that about halves the ammonia criteria. Oh. And you can see that, you know, municipalities would take notice of that. And, uh, but it, it may be a part, it may not be the sole reason, but when you've got a wastewater effluent dominated river like this, and we wanna maintain very high quality conditions, that these things better be squeaky clean in their operation. I'm not, I'm not sure that's happening. Because even in our own work in, in 2012, we saw a decline in the fish assemblage out of exceptional. And well, I mean, in, in, in probably the not too distant future, I can envision uh, one or more of these plants applying for, for to, to increase their loading on the Little Miami. And if that happens, I suspect it will, um, we ought to be ready with the data that says, yes, uh, I think we can, uh, this can be assimilated, it can work, or no, it can't, and this is why. Um, but just, you know, telling a, a county commissioner that you're concerned only goes so far. And that's why I, I asked the question, can MBI um, do that analysis so we have a, some good stuff? Well, we can, but it won't be, it won't be inexpensive. Uh, we've, Give me a problem. We have tried to apply for grants to do a statewide assessment right. of these things. It's just difficult to get. Everybody thinks we've succeeded in dealing with sewage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the proof is there statewide. I mean, 90% of the rivers meet their, you know, meet their uses. And uh, so much better than that. But, you know, you're exactly right. We're uh, these things can change. I mean, we're still growing. You know? Right. And I, I just don't see an alternative to having fi finding the funds to have you do this. Um, and you say, well, we're going to rely on Ohio EPA's budget, <laughs> or, or this, or that, or the other. I, I just uh, at this point, I don't have a lot of faith in that uh, happening. Um, so that's. Uh, you're, you're our best hope, I think. Yeah, and I mean, there, there's, Ed's already derived, you know, stressor values for mussels based on a statewide analysis we did in around 2010 with the then state database. The, pro the problem with mussels is the people who do mussel surveys, they're good practitioners for mussels, but they're not, they're not doing a, a pollution assessment. Uh, right. I mean, uh, you know, I respect the heck out of Mike Hogarth, but when he, he's kind of speculating on what the causes are of the muscle decline, he throws out a few, you know, low DO, but did anybody ever really measure that or put the pieces of that puzzle together? And that's a, you know, high EPA comes as close to doing that as anyone, you know, anywhere. And, but they don't look at muscles. So it's, you know, we have to make those connections at some point. Well, that's all part of a strategy that we sorely need here in Little Miami, that's for sure. Um, Anthony, uh, <clears throat> Anthony, I'd like to uh, supplement what you said uh, before about uh, comments that you made about the eDNA, uh, the potential for eDNA, and, and I agree with uh, what you're saying. It, 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 it would be helpful to use that to, to find out what's there so we can make some decisions about where to go and where to look for the muscles and, and trying to determine what would be, what's the most suitable environment for them and where, do, where does that appear on the Little Miami River? And um, I saw that you 
and you mentioned and talked about the, the Klimas, the Katie Klimas study of the Clinch River. I was frankly really excited about that when I read it because the Clinch River, the places where they sampled and produced uh, muscle eDNA, uh, an assay that can be used by others. Uh, it's a similar river to ours and, and, and in a similar part of the country. And I do know that um, the, um, the Kit people, the Jonah Water people have that and they're working on it and they're, they're building a library of muscle eDNA. So I think it's, uh, I'm excited about what's, what's being done. And I think it offers us the possibility that we could do some sampling um, and send it someplace like Jonah Water, which has a large library of muscles and begin finding out, determining with these simple tests where the muscles are. And it's not gonna tell us how many, it's not gonna tell us their condition or anything, but if we can do that and also determine where the host fish are, I think that may be useful information. And uh, our, our goal is to help, uh, to supplement in any way we can, the work that needs to be done in order to figure this out. Uh, that paper was written uh, a couple years ago. Uh, the eDNA is being worked on daily. The improvements will be made. Each, each library will be getting bigger. And, but to make decisions uh, that are significant, uh, we're going to be needing to uh, look at what uh, there is in terms of, uh, I don't know, needs, the future needs. We're, we're, we're part of the way there. We're part of the way there, but there's still, there's still a lot to figure out uh, with eDNA. I mean, it's it's a and it's emerging emerging science. So, I think it's it's like I said, a, a supplement, uh, and it'll help. But uh, right now, these agencies haven't accepted it, and it will be super important for things like uh, wastewater plants uh, to have a protocol that's accepted by the. By the agencies in the future, so not there yet, but it's a it's a tool, and it, it can add some information. But we're not uh, replacing anything. We're just we're just adding to it. So, um, Anthony, on your slide, you know that one of the first things uh, is you know is great. You know, determine what others are doing. Uh, besides what I think I hear about maybe Monty McGregor's work on the licking in Kentucky. Are there other, which would sounds to me from what I've heard again, um, is it's been fairly successful. Um, are there lessons that we can learn? If, if that's true, is there are lessons we can learn from his experience and, and you know, are there, are there examples of any successes, um, uh, you know, closer to home, uh, that, and that's pretty close. To home. Yeah, on the, on the translocation, in other words, moving muscles from one place to another to see if they'll survive. Um, <laughs> you need a long, a number of years to figure out if they're if they have survived. Um, the ones that have been done in Ohio, it's mostly on the Big Derby. Uh, they're still there. We don't know if they've reproduced, and it's been ten years. There, there are species that it's really difficult to determine. OSU is doing a lot of that in Ohio or has done a lot of it. Uh, in uh, other states, like out in Illinois, the Illinois Natural History Survey is working on a lot of that. But I haven't seen a whole lot uh, where the people have uh, said that they're advanced enough to say if they've been really successful or successful yet or not. Uh, I think it's a challenge, but finding out what these others are doing, there's a, there's a lot to, to figure out. And like the translocation is one, the eDNA is another, USGS is doing some stuff in Ohio. Water Hague 
or excuse me, Wendell Haig in Kentucky at the Forest Service is doing some stuff to look at muscle Im uh, pollutant impacts, uh, placing uh, muscles around the country in several states, trying to figure out if he can, he plus a big team can analyze what's going on. That's that's happening right now. I didn't put him on this list. It's really not just him. It's it's a it's a whole team of of organizations across a number of states. Oh. Um, so uh, that uh, you know, and I brought that up with OSU is is and OSU is a partner with Wendell Haig on that project, uh, placing muscles out there to try to see what what is impacting them. Uh, so uh, I, hopefully that answered at least part of your question, Eric. Well, so, is it is it possible that the Little Miami can be more of a of a proving ground for that kind of work? I mean, I'm not sure where all. Where well, to me, it could be. Uh, again, you'd have to ask OSU. Could they do work, or Montgomery in Kentucky, or uh, Wendell Haig? So, uh, I, I think uh, reaching out to these guys is uh, one of the things you could do, and they might right. just be very interested in the Little Miami because of the impacts that have been documented. Well, you, you know, exactly. You've got an effluent dominated stream. You've got some, some exceptional uh, levels in fish and mic and macroinvertebrate to health. And yeah, I, I, I would hope they would have that reaction. Yeah, that's an interesting thing that we could, uh, and here's what it will cost. And then we just go out and raise the money because we, yeah. we're not, we're not getting anywhere without, uh, getting down to the details on this and translocation you've got to have a source some of their some of them are raised like in kentucky or at osu you can use those another thing that's been done i just want to quickly point out in the chat box there's a question about where some mussels were uh, affected by the removal of a dam i think that might have been in the great miami not sure it says near in dayton near the art institute uh well, water was on Stillwater. The Stillwater had a dam. At Aaron's still here. Maybe he can shed some light on that. No, maybe not. Um, so the, the Stillwater had a dam at Welsh Milton where I, I was there and they took the uh, uh, mussels to another location upstream where hopefully they'll survive. They had the snuff box, for example, one of the extirpated species from the Little Miami uh, that was moved. As, as a, that was a good one. Uh, so it can be done and has been done nearby. Uh, one thing, uh, given the amount of effluent in the Little Miami, I wonder if a group like the Water Environment Research Foundation, which sometimes funds things that might be of, uh, they fund things related to wastewater treatment and so on, and given the, uh, the potential influence of ammonia, maybe I haven't looked at their, uh, you know, I think sometimes they'll, they'll accept uh, proposals and so on, uh, given the link between ammonia and effluent and, and muscles and the muscle criteria, uh, maybe that's a possible source of funding for work in a little Miami. I don't know what Chris thinks. He's maybe been a little more, uh, uh, knowledgeable about that maybe you have a short memory ed we we tried that on their unsolicited grants for uh it wasn't aimed at muscles but it was aimed at you know the the statewide yeah assessment okay. that we've always wanted to do and we we tried it with the Ohio water development authority and um it's just been difficult to get again you're 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 swimming up upstream against people that think, "Why look at why look at permits? We've we've succeeded, and we've already got, you know, a, a good process in place, and so on." Uh, which may work for meeting minimum, you know, Clean Water Act goals, but uh, <laughs> mussels have elevated that to a different level in, in our view, and. Uh, so, I do remember being at an EPA meeting about 25 years ago where they were talking about, this is one thing we're still pretty bad, but 
Uh, I think it's someone from West Virginia said, well, we've issued all our permits, therefore everything must be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not funny. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's, you know, state agencies have been slowly whittled away and compliance oversight has definitely been reduced over the past 15, 10 to 15 years. And, uh, is, is there additional water quality, in-stream water quality monitoring that needs to be done to help track uh, potential impact, whether it be the ammonia loadings or whether it be, you know, we, we, we've started to play with the idea of, of these continuous, you know, DO samplers, um, you know, every 15 minutes around the clock during the warmer months. Um, and what, what we've heard back from Greene County and, and from Warren County is they like that and they'd like to put some, potentially put some money into uh, in, increasing the amount of sampling, in-stream sampling that's going on so that we can get a better, perhaps get a better handle on what's going on out there. Is there, that, is any of that sound there's that a, it leads us somewhere? Yeah, there's a whole protocol related to that, which we, we do, but it, it involves beyond deployment of the data zones, it's collecting uh, chlorophyll A data and the allied chemical parameters that all go in with direct and indirect effects of nutrients. So, um, and, and again, we, we just did that for the Olentangy and Scioto this summer and we're putting those results together uh, now. <laughs> and uh, it would be, uh, I, I don't know if a high EPA sampled the Little Miami last year or not, if they were able to get to it, but they're doing kind of a more synoptic effort on their large rivers yeah. statewide, which means they're probably going to be doing about 40% of the site coverage. And, you know, how, how reliable that's going to end up being, who knows, until we see the results. But... Um, you know, when you talk about, you know, the effect of nutrients, it's, it's definitely more than just measuring nutrient concentrations, but having measurements that uh, give you the, the effect that nutrients have. And of course, the starting point is going to be algae and photosynthesis and the effect on the DO regime, which in turn impacts aquatic animals. Right. And uh, it, it's, it's dependent on a, on a lot of dynamics around flow and habitat in addition to chemical water quality. So yeah, that would be productive to do, but it, 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 it needs to be done, you know, it needs to be comprehensive enough to, to do that. And uh, So yeah, that that's we, we would definitely encourage things like that to be done. Uh, now, whether that the other thing with mussels that uh, it, in fact, when we raised this issue in 2012, when we had the decline in the in the Hamilton County part of the river that we observed in our work for MS, MSD, and we trade we tried to trace upstream and we did not get exceptional conditions until we got above the confluence with, I believe it was Caesar Creek. And uh, they had, had had toxic algal blooms in all those reservoirs that summer. And microcystin is toxic to aquatic life. And I would think a filter feeder like a mussel would really be potentially adversely affected. So there's another, you know, another unknown, you know, angle. And that, and th that would be the, what you're saying is that would be the releases from the reservoirs uh, that would be impacting downstream from the HAB. Yeah, because those releases were really the, you know, we hit, we had critical low flows in 2012. So the amount of, you know, the amount of impact that those releases would have would be uh, expanded. Right. Um, 
but I, I know there's an increased uh, attention being given to uh, uh, to Caesar Creek, to the reservoir, and and um, uh, some sampling and modeling going on, and and uh, I think well, OKI is involved, and and uh, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts are, the Central State is involved, um, and. Um, you know, and, and I've mentioned to the to the collaborative that's been formed there. You know, I said our our interest. To, I shouldn't say this way, but I'd, our interest is not the reservoir. Our interest is downstream, and what the impact can be, or what whether there needs to be a different management regimen, or maybe not. I don't know. Um, for possible impacts downstream, that just sets the whole tone for permits and everything else that uh, we look at. Very I'll point out uh, here that somebody trying to ask you a question. I'm not sure what that is. Some background noise. Um, I, I've got a little after nine o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I, we're, we're getting on in time, but um, uh, in terms of next steps, I could see some. Uh, basically, the list that you had up there, uh, Anthony, you know, pursuing those items and and and, and others. Um, there we go, and maybe reconvening this this session, you know, in the not too distant future after we've got uh, so, some additional thoughts in mind uh, from this list. Uh, what else? Some some uh, last questions, statements, um, things to focus on. Yeah, I I think we've had some good discussion, and I thank MBI uh, and and all of you uh, for being with us tonight, and uh, we look forward to continuing the discussion. We need to get these problems solved and. And uh, everybody's got a role here, so thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Chris, you want to, uh, your last comments? Let, let me ask when we're going to get the oh. slideshow with the, with the uh, references and the materials and all that that you referred to and said this will be available to us. How are we going to yeah. get them? Yeah, I'll work on it tomorrow. So to try to make sure that you get that. Uh, tomorrow, if, if, if at all possible. And we'll post uh, post the recording of the session up on YouTube. Yeah, uh, I have to take the recording and transfer it to Eric. Okay. All right, sounds good. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot uh, to Lil Yeah, I, I don't have anything more to say except to thank uh, Bill and Eric for inviting us back. We appreciate that, and we, well, we're, hopeful we're, we're, we're glad you're there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa, I, I, and, and back at you. I, uh, we're, we're, we're always pleased to work with you guys, and, and, um, and let's, let's, let's do some more. Very good. Thank you. Thanks again.